I just want to start by, um, Avante, can you bring up the slide for the, the first verse of the chorus? Let your name be the passion of the church. Uh, spiritual warfare is alive, active, um, and I just faced all kinds of opposition this week as I prepared this message and I uh, just truly appreciate um, just the Holy Spirit, these words, this verse, this song. Um, you know, weeks ago as the worship team sat down and planned this and uh, just a great intro and a great way to go into this, but um, I hope that you believe the words that you sang because um, come to believe this week that the church has a problem. We have more methods to communicate than at any other time in the history of the world. Since the days of the Tower of Babel, Satan has used a unified, dishonest communication in a bid to thwart God's plans. As Pastor Derek taught us last week, it can be difficult to sort honest communication from the dishonest communication. Honesty is not the only biblical principle of communication that Satan attacks, but it was the first principle that he attacked. In my opinion, there's never been a time when Satan has so actively undermined the honesty of Scripture. The church is founded on the integrity of the Word of God, and the foundation of that Scripture has been under attack since the day Eve ate the forbidden fruit in the garden. Since that fateful day, the devil has continued to challenge God's Word, and this is the problem. Christians have forgotten that spiritual warfare is real. Christian soldiers have disobeyed the commander's instruction to hold fast the faithful word. Instead of believing God's honest word, they follow their feelings, lies planted by the devil himself. And Christian soldiers have allowed the fortress, the church, to crack and crumble under the forces of the enemy's persistent attacks. Christians excuse their negligence with offhanded statements. They would say, our fortress is still good enough. Our fortress is still attracting visitors by the masses. The church. The problem is that many Christians using these arguments have not even laid eyes on the fortress in question in several years. So now, the entire battalion of dedicated Christian warriors was embroiled in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the courtyard. The remaining forces in the fortress are now being aroused from their slumber and responding to the sounds of close battle. These ill-equipped men and women are now scrambling to recover rusty armor and hustle to their posts. Some soldiers cannot even lose sword from the scabbard. Those who successfully draw their swords become overwhelmed by pangs of grief formed by the sight of the dull and rusty blades. Soldiers are still reporting to their posts. Some bend, hands on their knees, and catch their breath. One soldier catches his commander's eye. <clears throat> the commander looks at him. The soldier grumbles in response. Late is better than never. The commander scowls. A disappointment at his brief visual inspection reveals missing helmets of salvation, armors of righteousness, belts of truth, shields of faith, boots of peace, and the double-edged swords of the word of God. These soldiers... Soldiers only in name, not function. These soldiers would soon prove to be no match for the enemy's battle-hardened force. The commander has tried his best to teach them. Soldiers would not show up for the would show up for the mandatory training regimens, but they would skip the optional training he provided. This commander knows that many of God's soldiers had grown lazy and complacent. God will fight for us, they'd once confidently stated. But now they use this truth as an excuse to hide the laziness and negligence. Battle has come. Actually, battle's always been there. Yet somehow this battle, this moment, the, the battle is more intense, more desperate, more real. This battle is affecting the soldier's livelihood in a tangible way. See, the church has a problem. They've forgotten that spiritual warfare is also intense. Satan is at the gates, roaming, hissing, roaring about as Goliath of old, taunting and provoking his enemy. Time is only his friend. His minions run to and fro in the courtyard, mercilessly crucifying all who defend the honesty of God's word. The devil's forces will stop at nothing until every stone from this fortress is thrown down, 
till the walls of the church lie as the walls of Jericho and the king of kings is dethroned. Now you and I know the king will never be dethroned. Satan knows this too, though I think he truly hopes his efforts will defeat God in the end. See, Satan's communication is beguiling, it's corrupt, it's deceitful, and it only promotes selfishness. So soldiers, we have a duty to defend the truth. We can only defend truth if we communicate in a godly manner. God's standard of communication is honest. It is peaceful. Please locate this morning's passage, Ephesians 4, 26. And today you need to know that angry communication is a deadly weapon. Communication is not just limited to the words that we speak. We also communicate through our body language and written communication, newspapers, magazines, blogs, social media, Ephesians 4.26 says this, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So the first thing that you need to know about anger is this. Anger is a spiritual problem. We know from this verse that anger is able to produce sin. Sin is, therefore, a spiritual problem. Anger already lives in our heart. Our heart is a seat of emotion, a seat of passion. Do you remember someone sitting you down, having a heart-to-heart talk to explain what anger is? Did someone have to tell you how to respond and how to show that anger at other people? Someone might have explained how to channel that anger so that you can manipulate other people and get what you want, but no one had to explain or show you how to be angry. Have you ever felt a strong displeasure towards another person. Merriam-Webster says, that is anger. Have you ever been antagonistic? That is, have you ever used an opportunity to retaliate against somebody who has done something to you? Merriam-Webster says, that is anger. Synonyms for anger include ire, rage, fury, indignation, and wrath. These are strong words, and they show an intense Hotly burning emotion that consumes the person and consumes all those who stand nearby. Have you ever felt this way? So do you agree with me that anger already lives in your heart? It's important. We need to know what creates anger in me. Feel free to look on the screen. James 4, 1 through 2 says this. What causes quarrels, what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. You desire and you do not have, and so you murder. You covet and you obtain. You fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask, do not receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You see, anger burns in us when our own wants and our own desires are at risk. That is called lust. When we're desiring something we cannot have, we want control, control of the other person, control of the situation. We want selfishness. We want what is best for us, not what's best for the other person. And then we have the wrong value system. Anger burns in us when our pride is at risk. We may be ashamed about something. Maybe our past or our current mistakes are being brought to light. Maybe our inadequacies, our weaknesses, our failures, or our shame are being exposed or at risk of being exposed creates anger, creates that hot passion. The last two weeks, Pastor Derek has reminded us in Ephesians 4 that this is written to believers. This is a really important point because we cannot escape sin, the consequences of sin, on our own merit. And if you want to do some research, go ahead and read Ephesians 4 this week and list all the verses with the phrases that make this point that Ephesians 4 is written for believers. Anger is therefore replaced with peace through Jesus. Newton's first law of motion helps me build a case for this point. The law says this, an object in motion tends to stay at motion or an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless, somebody help me, it's acted on by an outside force, okay? And so, before our relationship with God, the same is true with our battle with sin. We used to indulge in our selfish behaviors. Ephesians 4, 5, Romans 8 prove this point. 
We were in bondage to sin. We were completely unable to escape sin, completely unable to escape the prison yard of sin until we were set free by God's miraculous act of salvation. And once we are free, we need to get away from that prison, get away from our captors with as much urgency as possible. We're free. Why would we want to play around the courtyard or the gates of that prison? Get away from it. That's the remove principle that we've been working through. Next is the renew principle, that God, through Jesus, intervened and changed the direction we were naturally heading, an outside force acting on us. And so we need to learn new ways of thinking. This means washing the impure thoughts away with the pure thoughts of the Word. We need to remove, remove we need to renew our minds and then the other principle is that we need to replace those sinful behaviors. So we need to learn those new ways of thinking, but that only makes a difference so far as what we practice them. And so we practice what we're learning, and God will empower us to make new habits and profitable habits. Look at Ephesians 5.1. After our relationship with Jesus began, the battle for anger became real, became intense. Now we have a target. That target is sin. And we can work on that in our lives through the help of God. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Why does Ephesians 5.1 tell us that we need to imitate with God? The answer is simple. Because we will not imitate God naturally. It does not come easy. We have to put work and effort into imitating God. We already know how to sin. We already know how to evade the consequences of sin. And so, imitating God starts with that reconciliation through peace. And that's a miraculous act of God directly in our lives. How many of you are motivated to avoid pain? I know I am. I hate pain. I hate the tension it produces. So let's just avoid that and get to the good parts, right? And not have to deal with it. Well, this next point is for me, next point is for you, because anger has devastating consequences. So I hope by sharing the consequences of anger that you'll be motivated with me to say, yeah, we're not going to go there. Ephesians 4.27, back in your, your scriptures, be angry and give no opportunity for the devil. See, the first devastating consequence is this, that sinful anger provides a foothold for the devil. He does this in a few different ways. Do not allow the devil to gain a foothold through lies. That's where we've been the last two weeks that Pastor Derek's taken us through. Verse 25. Let's read this in a slightly different way than what we've read it before. It says, Therefore, having put away falsehood in each of you, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And be angry, do not sin, and give no opportunity for the devil. Have you ever been in an argument and used the words, you always, you never, fill in the blank, you are a intense. Well, in our anger, we become blind to truth and insensitive to the other person's needs. Someone once put it like this, when we are angry, we are stupid. See, the brain stops functioning, causes a short circuit, and we can't function rationally. Lies create a foothold for the devil, and anger allows us to act on that, <clears throat> sinful anger. Number two, don't allow the devil to gain a foothold when I'm alone. The Jonathan Edwards believed when he was alone, or when he was angry at an object, that um, he was really angry with God. And I think that's sometimes the case when we're angry with an object. I know when I'm angry with an object, I'm often... Um, alone and often not angry at God, but I become angry at the person who put it there. Like when I'm walking around the house at night and I walk into a table or twist an ankle on shoes or step on the fin of a metal airplane or something like that. It doesn't belong there and I can immediately get angry at the person who put it there. And when we're angry and we're alone, there's more opportunity to sin because start to believe lies. My anger won't affect anyone else, so why should I filter my reaction in that moment? This is a lie of the devil. God is always present. 
See, how we respond when we're alone, when no one else is watching, this is a practice test for when a real person is involved. I will most certainly fail. If I fail a practice test, I will fail the real test. So I know I need to study harder if I'm going to succeed in those angry moments when other people are around. Do not allow the devil to gain a foothold through friendly fire. Friendly fire is when a soldier opens fire on soldiers wearing and fighting for the same flag. This is usually caused by an electronics function, an equipment malfunction, poor communication, misidentification of the enemy or the uniform or equipment. Friendly fire has very devastating and far-reaching consequences, including heavy fines, negative publicity, jail time, also with that removal from spouse, family, close friends, lack of contact with loved ones, and a lifetime of shame and guilt associated with those choices. Consider this example. In 1994, two U.S. helicopters were shot down by friendly fire in Iraq, killing 11 people, 11 friendlies. Five soldiers were court-martialed for their part in the tragedy, and this was a scandal that rocked our nation. Another example, an article on PBS.org wrote this. Nine British soldiers were killed on February 17, 1991, when two U.S. Air Force A-10 attack aircraft fired on armored personnel carriers in southern Iraq, making it for an Iraqi target the Americans were trying to destroy 13 miles to the east. In all, 35 Americans and 9 British troops were killed by friendly fire in the Gulf War. The Americans killed in this situation represented nearly one quarter of the total of 148 U.S. combat deaths. I watched a video of the communication between the pilots in this instant, and all I can tell you is the intensity of their grief was real. See, friendly fire is a waste, a misuse of national resources. The tax dollars, the equipment, the other resources, it's all meant to wage war on the target, target the enemy and the enemy alone. It's also a fact that enemies, uh, excuse me, that families grieve longer and perhaps more intensely when their soldier is killed via friendly fire because their soldier did not die as a war hero but as a murder victim. Friends, this is how Satan uses anger. Satan scrambles our communication, he messes with our target systems. He makes us believe that a fellow soldier is the enemy and so we pull the trigger and we take him out. Do you agree that friendly fire is a tragedy? I hear an amen. Amen! The point is long, but this is critical to understand the devastation that sinful anger produces. If you're repulsed by the, the image of friendly fire going to go one more place. In warfare, only one more act is more tragic, more repulsive than friendly fire, and it's called intentional friendly fire. Got an illustration of a frag grenade on the screen. Intentional friendly fire is when a soldier knowingly targets a fellow soldier and kills him. Do not allow the devil to gain a foothold through intentional friendly fire. This became a big issue during the Vietnam War. Soldiers who disagreed with an officer, uh, whether their political goals or the goals of the campaign, they would target and kill their commanding officer. And this was usually accomplished by taking a frag grenade and exploding it, making it look like the enemy had killed both parties. This war crime became known as fragging and often created a feeling of terror from the commanding officers in Vietnam. Officers making tough choices became terrorized by the possibility of their lives being lost in a fragging incident. Intentional friendly fire is a betrayal of the mission. It's a betrayal of the flag. It's a betrayal of the country. This is treason. Remember when I said the church has a problem? Look at these verses with me. Proverbs 29, 11. 
A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Do you see the frag grenade in that? Next verse, Proverbs 29, 22. Man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression, much heartache, much devastation. The consequences of anger are real. This is an explosive problem. In our homes, in our communities, we make deliberate treasonous actions against Christ directed at fellow Christian soldiers. I'm angry, and I'm going to let you have it. We throw in the hand grenade, and every time we do that, in anger, we are guilty of friendly fire or intentional friendly fire, and this is sin. See, we're supposed to be battling Satan, but instead we wound and we incapacitate our fellow soldiers. Anger's devastating consequences are rooted in this. We justify our sinful anger. Anger becomes a silent killer of the church. Brothers and sisters, in Paul's words, do not let it be named among you. Our next point, sinful anger does not produce fruit. This is very clear in Ephesians 5.11, if you look across the page in your Bible. 5.11 says this, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 6 says this. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. See, a heart planted in the infertile desert cannot grow to its full potential or it cannot bear the fruit that it was intended to to bear. Sinful anger only produces loneliness. This is broken friendships, broken marriages, broken families, and a life of isolation. These are the only rewards, the only fruit of a life of sinful anger. But you know what? There's a remedy for this. Christian soldiers are called to be united. Unity means being closely formed, having carefully cultivated relationships. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6 is a beautiful passage because in that, the, name, the unity and the one are mentioned over and over again. Be unified in spirit, the bond of peace, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. You see, anger divides, but unity through God can build and edify and build lasting relationships. But you know what? The fruit of the Spirit cannot grow when anger is fertilizing the tree. Catch this with me. The anger left unresolved produces bitterness. Bitterness, in my mind, is best illustrated by this cauldron of boiling, icky, sticky goo. So this goo bubbles. It festers until this Mexi concoction is at its foulest. Worry, fear, shame, doubt, and maybe a pinch of lies, all the ingredients that bitterness and anger require. What will happen when we pour this prescription on our fruit trees? They will shrivel, they will die. They will fail to complete their mission to produce much fruit. And so the fruit of the Spirit cannot grow when angerness, when bitterness is fertilizing the tree. If I've done my job in the last few minutes, I've begun to make you angry. Perhaps it was my description of the chaos of the frag grenade. Perhaps it was the imagery of attacking your fellow soldiers and your fellow Christians. And not only, um, hopefully you were able to put some names and some faces to those and to that devastation. Perhaps I've begun to stir feelings of pity for loved ones whose lives have already been wrecked by the poison of bitterness. And perhaps I pulled on the heartstring of a married couple who are going to wage a new war on anger for the sake of their marriage. So remember this feeling because the next point that you need to know in our battle against anger is that anger is acceptable. 
We get this from Ephesians 4, 26, 27, 30 through 32. Look with me in, in your Bible. It says this, Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ's sake forgave you. You see, anger was created by God. I like this next illustration because Snow White was a very poor judge of character. Everything about the witch in this image screams, don't take the fruit, don't trust her. And I was just very disturbed as a child watching this because of this screaming at Cinderella, you're a fool, don't take it. Well, I like this image because think back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were created with emotions. Who put those emotions? Who created them? God did. And sometime between Genesis 1-1 and Eve's temptation, Lucifer challenged God. Sin was introduced, and then Satan was cursed to roam the earth. Okay, so the first time, and for the first few verses of their existence, um, Adam and Eve had no use for the emotion of anger. And then Satan's temptation caused tension. Satan directly attacked God's word to possibly create anger in Eve. He said this in the beginning of Genesis 3, You will not surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. I can almost hear the witch's voice crackling in that statement. See, originally Eve was trusting in a God who could not lie. Satan then claims that God had lied, and perhaps this caused Eve to become angry angry at the wrong thing because the God that she knew the God that she trusted is a liar and that Eve directed her anger toward God instead of Satan this next point anger is intended to please God if Eve had thought about this and if anger was her root then she would have used her anger to say as Jesus did get behind me Satan I want nothing to do with you I'm going to believe in the God who cannot lie. Ephesians 4.26 Be angry and do not sin. We know in several instances in Scripture that Jesus was angry and he did not sin. Mark 3.5 says this, And he, Jesus, looked around at them with anger and grieved at the hardness of heart. He said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. We also know that Jesus angrily drove out the money changers in Matthew 21. See, Jesus was angry, but he used that passion to channel that anger in a pure way. His actions in these examples dispensed justice and peace to two different groups of people and different parties in each situation. So anger is intended to please God. Next, anger is acceptable because it's an early warning system. It's a smoke detector, if you will. Alex, as a fireman, you have a lot of experience around fires, smoke detectors. What does a smoke detector do, and what is its purpose? That's a good point. (laughs) It lets you know when there's a hidden danger that you can't see the smoke or maybe even a carbon monoxide detector. You know, you don't know that danger is there. And, and smoke detectors have a lot of features. They have a really high-pitched beeping or screeching. If you've ever been in an industrial setting, when a smoke detector goes off, 
There are lights and strobes. You can feel the sound pulsing in your chest. Everything about that situation screams, something is wrong, get to safety. When that smoke detector goes off, is it wise to stay in that room and pretend that nothing is wrong? The consequences are devastating if you don't believe what that early warning system is doing. And so God created those emotions, and therefore they're, no, they're neither good nor evil, but it's when we act on those emotions that either good or evil are produced. Look again at Ephesians 4.31. And in summary, what the verse is really saying is angrily put away anger. Deal with your sinful anger. Put it away from you with all of the hatred, the passion that you can muster. Do not allow that to get anywhere near you. Allow that early warning system to do its job. Evacuate the premises. Don't stay in that danger zone. We know that anger is very hard to control. We've considered their explosive, their deadly, its deadly effects. And so perhaps another point of Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 is this. Even if we have already sinned in thought, we should take great care so we do not sin in deed. In comparison to all the times that we get angry, the times that we can demonstrate a holy, a pure anger is likely just a drop in the bucket. See, this statistic should give me pause because when I feel angry, my chance of reflecting God in that moment is very slim. So because of that, because of that statistic, anger demands a godly action. <clears throat> We need to be wise and minimize the risk of becoming angry. See, the, the point of the verse is clear. It's a line in the sand, if you will. Never go to bed angry, verse 26. Well, John Piper asks this question. When is the devil allowed into your teenager's bedroom? When is he allowed into a married couple's bedroom? This context gives it away. It's when we're angry, when we allow that anger, a person to go to bed without solving that issue. And so in that moment, that anger becomes that cauldron of the green boiling goo. That anger is festering, bubbling, and poisoning our fruit. And this perspective of science, science proves that the things that a person looks at or thinks about right before going to bed are the things that the mind is going to chew on all night long. <clears throat> Wisdom tells us that we should not pick or f a fight or discuss a topic with a person who's going to be passionate about that topic right before going to bed. Wisdom tells us that as supper is closing in, I need to start picking my conversations more carefully. I need to use tact and caution in conversation with others so I don't provoke them to wrath in their tired and their weakest moments. Another point do not let the sun go down on your wrath. See, this can also mean this. Deal with today's tensions today. Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. When we put this in the context of anger, deal with today's anger today so you'll have the energy to deal with tomorrow's trouble tomorrow. Otherwise, you will begin fighting a tangled mess of yesterday's battles and two days' battles and the month's battles and the previous year's battles and a lifetime of battles. Deal with today's anger. Deal with today's tensions today so that you have a friend, a comrade, a fellow Christian soldier to go into the next day with you arm in arm and be prepared to fight those battles with somebody instead of alienating the people that you most want to fight beside you against the spiritual enemies. How much weight do you want to bear? How many consequences do you want to continue to pile because of anger left undealt with? And are you prepared for the weight of life if you don't heed this principle? 
<clears throat> Let's look at this. The anger is acceptable because it demands that we establish healthy filters. Psalm 4.4 4 is a, a tremendous verse. Um, it says this, Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. David recognized that we need an action plan. We need to have a, a habit. When we get angry, we need to put a filter in place so that we don't explode all over those that we love and care about. So the first point, the first action, the first filter we need to have in place is this. One, recognize when my smoke detector is going off. I made the statement earlier, when I'm angry, I'm stupid. My strong emotion clouds my judgment, and I'm preparing to throw the frag grenade in that moment. If I value peace and restoration, I will recognize and stop my anger before it produces sinful results. I will know when I'm prone to sinful anger so I can stop it before it has a chance to take root. I can consider the environment that I'm in. What can I do to change the room or create more space? Turn off the TV, turn down the noise, move to a spot where maybe there's not the commotion or people walking back and forth or put off the conversation to a different time when I'm not so stressed and trying to get dinner on the table. I can control that. I need to know how to back out of a conversation when it's ill-timed. Um, use clear communication that cannot be waved off. Sometimes we use a generic excuse of, I'm too tired for this right now. I'm too tired to discuss this right now. Well, you know, if you, if you get in the habit of using this excuse, uh, the other person hearing this can think that you're avoiding the situation and that you don't want to deal with the situation at hand. When in reality, what you really need to say is that <clears throat> I most definitely value what you are saying to me and I most definitely want to discuss this topic, but I want to have this conversation with you in a healthy way. Can we please put off this conversation until such and such a time? I'll be ready. Let's work through it then. Sounds a lot better than I'm too tired to talk about this right now, right? <clears throat> the next filter we need to establish, we need to ask good questions. We need to ask, what did I see, hear, or feel? And feel is in touch, not the emotion. Don't focus on the, your emotion in this. That stirred me to anger. What did I see, hear, or feel that stirred me to anger? What did I want that I was not getting? My heart is deceitful. Am I trying to impose my values on another person? Why did I respond so strongly to that stimulus? Was sin involved in the situation? Be very careful not to call another person's, person's methods or their opinions sinful. I don't know their motives. All I can see are the concrete facts in front of me. What did I hear, see, or touch? Those are the concrete. Don't even deal with the emotions yet. They're deceitful. After I ask good questions, next I need to examine how do I best respond? Where do I go from here? This step should always begin with prayer and is the beginning of the reconciliation process. This allows the Holy Spirit time to work. The other day I walked into the house and corrected my wife gently. Not a, not a big deal. Nothing that was a big deal or sinful. And she immediately became angry with me. And I became angry at her anger. And in, instead of exploding on her, I just walked out of the house and shoveled snow. And during that period of time, I just prayed, God, I'm, I'm hurt. I just wanted to love my wife and help her through this. And now things, we're getting ready for supper and just chaos in my home. And we really need to talk about this. But I can't do this on, on my own. And went inside dealt with that, trusted God, looked for the right time. Hour, hour and a half later maybe, um, things had settled down, timing was great, and I didn't even need to initiate a conversation because I knew that my wife is habitually controlled by the Holy Spirit. I love that about my wife. Because she's habitually controlled by the Holy Spirit, that allowed the manner that I confronted 
um, that situation and use that anger to promote reconciliation because I knew that the Holy Spirit was a part of her life. So I could trust him to resolve that. And sure enough, didn't need to say anything. She came up to me and said, I am so sorry. I responded in anger, and I did the same exact thing to you that I hate when other people do to me. Because I stopped and I prayed about that situation, <clears throat> I sought God's help, I was able to reap the rewards of God answering my prayer and the Holy Spirit taking something, taking care of something that was so important to me. Don't underestimate, don't undervalue the power of the Holy Spirit in the reconciliation process. Now, <clears throat> reconciliation is truly a miracle because it's only something that God can provide. So, apart from praying, allowing the Holy Spirit time to work, look for the right time and place to follow up with that other person. A college professor once called it this, a knee-to-knee, eye-to-eye conversation. You know the professor I'm talking about? Why would I want to solve our differences if we're both in our own trenches firing and lobbing hand grenades back and forth with each other? I don't want to come to a negotiation table like that. The person I'm fighting should be my ally in the conflict, not my enemy. We typically want the same results, just different methods. So we need to be immediately ready to drop our weapons, drop our knives, drop the hand grenades, and come to the negotiation table and meet in a knee-to-knee, eye-to-eye, intimate conversation because that proves that I trust my enemy. I'm not going to whip out a dagger. She's not going to whip out a dagger. We're going to be there and we're going to trust and allow peace to prevail over that negotiation. And so pick the right time and place so that can happen. In conclusion, remember that godly communication always promotes reconciliation. Now some of you might be thinking, you know, oh, love and peace and all's going to be well. And It's not a lovey-dovey or an unrealistic expectation because we know through Scripture we can only control our own actions. We can't control how the other person is going to respond. So to the best of my ability, my heart needs to be at peace with God. If my heart is at peace, that peace should overflow into the conversations that I'm having with other people and is going to provide the opportunity for my relationships to then be at peace. Honest communication has the potential to divide. Jesus taught us that Scripture will create tension between fathers, sons, daughters, mothers. We know that Scripture is a double-edged sword. It has the power to divide, but then again, it, just as equally, it's a tool for correction for healing, for instruction in righteousness. So the point is that we need to first trust God to deal with the other person's heart. And then I know in my heart, if I've done my checks, if I put on those filters, I know that my speech should lead to restoration. And then we need to pray that God will deal with the other person's heart. <clears throat> what now? Don't miss the view for the bugs. Bill Mounts tells a story about when him and his wife were driving home from a vacation in Southern California. And uh, this image is, is gorgeous. He says this, We drove to Redding. We set out early in the morning uh, so, so we could see Mount Shasta in the early morning light. As we drove halfway around, it was spectacular but our windshield was getting pretty messed up with dead bugs, but I didn't really notice. My eyes were focused on Mount Shasta. The bugs, or what was left of them, didn't affect my vision. Of course, you eventually have to stop, clean off the bugs. We were surrounded by things every day, by things of beauty, things that we can focus on and see God and be reminded of His greatness. We are also surrounded every day by the bugs of life. Annoyances that can so easily distract. Conflict in relationships 
lack of fulfillment in our work, house chores, unfulfilled dreams, worship music that is too loud or poorly written. And so we have a choice. We can focus on the bugs and go through life defeated and miserable, dragging everyone else around us down to our pit. Or we can focus on the beautiful Mount Shasta, be reminded of who God is, and deal with the bugs when we have to. It would be a pity to miss Mount Shasta because of a few dead bugs. And in closing, Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeem the time because the days are evil. Life is way too short to hold on to anger. Be at peace with God. Be at peace with people. Go live in peace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have so many opportunities and undisciplined moments to respond, to react, and sin. I think most of the time we're passionately driven by something and we, we forget in our passion to involve you in the solution. And I pray sincerely that each person here today will search their own hearts, to search their motives, and to make sure first that their relationship with you is on track and that they're at peace with you. God, we pray that um, we will be driven, that we'll be motivated to have godly communication, peaceful communication with others. And that because of that, people will see that we are different. That they'll experience the life change that you've given us the opportunity. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the gorgeous day. I pray that we'll be able to enjoy that. And again, just continue meditating on your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.